Herzlich willkommen auch von mir. Schön, dass ihr heute alle da seid bei der Veranstaltung Arbeiterinnen in der indischen Schuh- und Lederindustrie stärken. Helen hat ja schon gesagt, die Veranstaltung heute ist Teil der Reihe, einer Veranstaltungsreihe, immer auf dem Laufenden sein, mit der wir Einblicke geben wollen in die Produktionsstätten von Schuhen und Textilien, die Missstände beleuchten wollen, aber auch Alternativen und Handlungsmöglichkeiten aufzeigen möchten. Ich freue mich sehr, dass heute Pradipan und Sonja aus Indien dabei sind und äh, wir mit ihnen gemeinsam diskutieren können. Ähm, veranstaltet wird die, diese Reihe durch das Encota-Netzwerk. Seit 2015 arbeiten wir zum Thema Schuhe und Leder unter dem Slogan Change Your Shoes. Ähm, und wir haben einen besonderen Fokus auf Indien in dieser Arbeit. Ähm, genau, unser Ziel ist es, äh, die Arbeitsbedingungen zu vergessen und verbessern und eine faire, nachhaltige und transparente Schuhlieferkette zu schaffen. Genau. Ähm, bevor wir aber in die inhaltliche Diskussion einsteigen, ähm, möchte ich noch mal so ein bisschen breiter ähm, diskutieren oder an, anfangen und uns fragen, ja, wir alle tragen täglich Schuhe, aber wie oft schauen wir eigentlich darauf, woher unsere Schuhe kommen oder woher das Leder kommt, äh, ähm, aus denen unsere Schuhe hergestellt werden. Jährlich werden etwa 24 Millionen Paar Schuhe hergestellt ähm, ähm, und davon der Großteil in Asien. Wir haben noch mal zum Beginn noch mal eine kleine Umfrage mit euch vor, um noch mal so ein bisschen einzuführen in das Thema. Und ähm, Helen, das wäre super, wenn du die jetzt gleich einblenden könntest. Ähm ich, ähm, jetzt sehe ich leider, dass da was falsch war an der Einstellung. Also ich mache das schnell. Aber vielleicht bist du ein paar Antworten. Okay, auf. Dann, dann mache ich erst mal weiter. Genau. Dann machen wir gleich mit der Umfrage. Genau. Wir wollen heute einfach ähm, schauen, woher kommen eigentlich unsere Schuhe und nochmal hinterfragen, wer, wer hat diese eigentlich genäht äh, oder geklebt oder wenn es Lederschuhe sind, wo wurde das Leder gegerbt und ähm, dafür möchten wir heute nach Indien blicken und ähm, dann würde ich vorschlagen, ich stelle jetzt schon mal unsere beiden Referentinnen vor, die heute hier sind, äh, bevor wir dann mit der Umfrage starten. Ähm, heute soll es vor allem darum gehen, ähm, einerseits zu schauen, wie sind die Produktionsbedingungen in Indien, ähm, welche Missstände gibt es dort äh, im Schuh- und Lederbereich. Dann soll es auch äh, um die ganz aktuelle Situation gehen und die Auswirkungen der Corona-Krise auf die Arbeiterinnen sollen beleuchtet werden. Und am Ende möchten wir dann äh, mit Sonja und Pradipan auch noch darüber diskutieren, ähm, wie sieht eigentlich eure tägliche Arbeit aus, für die Rechte der Arbeiterinnen zu kämpfen und was sind da die Herausforderungen. Ähm, Pradipan, ähm, Pradi arbeitet ähm, als Projektkoordinator bei CBDEF India. Ähm, er leitet dort die Arbeit ähm, im Bereich Ledersektor und dazu zählen zum Beispiel Organisationen oder Unterstützerinnen von Heimarbeiterinnen, die Durchführung von Forschungsarbeiten zu den Arbeitsbedingungen in den Fabriken, ähm, Lobbyarbeit als auch Interessensvertretung. Er arbeitet seit mehr als acht Jahren zu den Themen Arbeit, Arbeitsrechte, Umwelt, Abfallmanagement und städtische Armut sind wichtige Themen, in denen er aktiv ist. Herzlich willkommen, Fradipan. Dann haben wir da Sonja Wasset, die arbeitet als Programmleiterin bei Society for Labor and Development, SLD in Nordindien. SLD ist eine Arbeitsrechtsorganisation die Arbeiterinnen in den Liefer in folgenden Lieferketten stärkt und unterstützt. Zum einen Bekleidung, Leder, ähm, aber auch Verarbeitung von Meeresfrüchten und ähm, Heimarbeit ist ein wichtiges Thema. Sie hat ähm, sich 15 Jahre lang mit Fragen rund um Arbeitsrechte, Existenzsicherung, ähm, besonders im Hinblick auf Gender- und Frauenrechte in Indien befasst. Schön, dass ihr beiden da seid. Ähm, Helen. Ja. Ah, super, genau. Wir möchten nämlich noch mal von euch wissen, um noch mal so einen allgemeineren Einstieg zu haben. Wie viel Paar Schuhe hast du letztes Jahr eigentlich gekauft? Waren es zwischen, war es 0, 1 bis 3, 4 bis 6 oder mehr als 6? Ähm, wo wurden deine Lieblingsschuhe hergestellt? Da gibt es Indien, China, Deutschland, anderswo oder ich weiß es nicht. Und wie kennst du dich, wie gut kennst du dich mit Arbeitsrechten in Indien aus? Gar nicht, ein bisschen gut oder ich bin Profi. Genau, wäre super, wenn ihr das beantworten würdet. Und genau, wir haben schon sechs Antworten. Sieben. Ja. 
Okay, noch ein paar. Jetzt haben wir 75 Prozent schon abgestimmt. Wer will noch? Okay, drei, zwei, eins. Dann können wir alle genau sehen. Okay, genau. Also wie viele Paar Schuhe, da sehe ich, dass die meisten von euch ein bis drei Schuhe gekauft haben. Dazu kann ich sagen, dass der Durchschnitt oder der deutsche, eine deutsche Person im Durchschnitt etwa fünf Paar Schuhe kauft. In den USA sind es noch mehr. Also die Lieblingsschuhe ist, äh, genau, wo werden sie hergestellt? Ähm, in Indien keines der Schuhe. Ähm, das ist natürlich jetzt spannend, dass wir jetzt nach Indien gucken. Einige wissen es auch gar nicht, was natürlich auch nochmal aufzeigt, dass es teilweise auch schwer ist, ähm, überhaupt nachzuverfolgen. Wo kommen die Schuhe eigentlich her, die wir gekauft haben? Ähm, und ähm, vor allem auch vielleicht für euch, äh, Sonja und Pradipan, interessant. Ähm, einige, die hier sind, kennen sich... Äh, ein bisschen mit den Arbeitsrechten aus und wir haben auch einen Profi dabei und äh, eine Person auch, die sich gut auskennt. Ähm, dann bin ich gespannt nachher auf die Diskussion äh, und würde dann hiermit jetzt auch das Wort ähm, an Pradipan übergeben, der ähm, damit starten wird, dass er einen Einblick gibt eigentlich in die Arbeitsrechtsverletzungen in der indischen Schuh- und Lederproduktion. Ähm, genau, Pradipan, du hast das Wort. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I feel very happy uh, being part of this program today and I'm excited as well. Uh, uh, I, I hope uh, the program, the event will be uh, useful for all the participants. Uh, I have a bad uh, throat today, so I might be coughing in between. So I request you to bear with me. Uh, yeah. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the working conditions in uh, the Indian uh, leather industry. Uh, can you can you uh, uh, switch to the first slide? Yes. So before doing that, I would like to give a brief introduction about uh, the organization that I represent. Uh, it's called uh, CVDEP India. Uh, CVDEP is an NGO based in uh, Bangalore in South of India. And uh, we work on workers' rights and uh, corporate accountability. And CVDEP was founded in the year 2000. Uh, much of our work is around the idea of decent work and uh, we work in sectors such as garments, leather, electronics, and plantations. As you know, all these sectors are part of uh, global supply chains. So what kind of work we do? Uh, we conduct uh, research on working conditions uh, in the, in the uh, factories uh, and, and in informal uh, uh, workplaces. And uh, we also uh, uh, do studies on the effects of corporate behavior across, across the sectors that we work, uh, garments, leather, electronics, and uh, plantations. And uh, our priority uh, work also includes engagement with workers. We, we uh, conduct worker education programs uh, focusing on uh, labor rights and uh, other aspects like gender, health, uh, occupational health and safety, and it goes on. And we also do advocacy and lobby with brands and uh, uh, government agencies to bring policy change uh, related to uh, labor rights. Can we move to the next slide? Yes. So now uh, let's see about CVDEP's engagement in the leather sector. Uh, so, uh, we started working in the leather sector in the year 2013. Uh, since our inception in 2000, in the year 2000, we have been focusing on the garment industry in leather, uh, garment industry in Bangalore. 
uh, but in 2013, uh, we thought it's it's very important that we focus on the leather sector as well. Uh, in the leather sector, our focus is on improving the living and working conditions of home-based workers and workers in uh, shoe factories and tanneries. So we have set up a, a workers resource center in a town, in a small town called Ambur in the state of Tamil Nadu in India. Uh, so Ambur is one of the uh, largest leather clusters, uh, a production leather production hubs in India. And uh, we have set up a workers resource centers to, uh, to do outreach uh, activities with workers like trainings. We also help them get access to government schemes and benefits. Uh, our other works in the leather, industry, uh, leather sector includes uh, research on working conditions. Uh, as I mentioned before, we conduct uh, capacity building programs for workers on their rights and entitlements. And we also do advocacy with brands and uh, government authorities. Uh, in 2017, we also engaged with two leather brands, UK-based leather brands, uh, in, in supporting them in mapping the home working supply chain. Uh, shall we move to the next slide? So now about the leather industry in India. <clears throat> Uh, in the past two decades, if you see, uh, the leather sector has seen remarkable uh, growth. Uh, it has become one of the largest foreign exchange earners for uh, the country and uh, a major contributor to the Indian economy. Uh, India is also the second largest producer of leather goods in the world, next to, only to China. And India is also the fourth largest exporter of leather goods. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the export uh, profile, 75% uh, of all leather goods uh, exported from India goes to uh, 11 major countries, uh, many of it uh, from the Europe. Uh, uh, USA is in the, on the top, followed by Germany, UK, Italy, France, Hong Kong, uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates, China, the Netherlands, and Belgium. So Europe plays a major role and Germany is one of the top importers uh, from India. Uh, leather industry is also a, a very labor intensive sector. It requires a lot of manpower. A uh, lot of operations are involved in, in leather production, uh, right from uh, tanning to finishing of leather to making of shoes. Uh, it all requires uh, manpower and uh, a rough estimate is that 2.5 million people in India are dependent on the leather sector for their livelihoods. And uh, very recently, a uh, large number of women are also participating, uh, are, are also getting employment uh, from the leather industry. And the share of women employment is about 30%. And they are mainly uh, employed in the tier one uh, shoe manufacturing units. Uh, if you look at the tanneries, uh, tanneries, uh, male workers work predominantly in tanneries compared to women workers. Uh, and, and if you look at the profile of the workers, they are mostly from the weaker se sections of the society. They are socially and economically backward. And uh, you would have heard about the conditions in the tanneries. And it is associated with uh, with uh, with with caste, for example, uh, the Dalits, the social and economically backward uh, class in India, uh, is employed in large number. Are employed in large number in the tanneries. Uh, the profile of the uh, leather workers is also changing very recently, uh, as as compared to the demographic change in the Indian Indian society. For example. Uh, leather industry today has one of the youngest workforces with 55% of workers uh, are below 35 years of age. Uh, if you look at the geographical spread out of the industry uh, in the south of India, Tamil Nadu is the ma major production hub for leather and leather goods. And in the north, the state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, where my colleague uh, Sonia comes from. And uh, the third uh, major uh, 
so uh, production hub is in west bengal it is in the east of uh, india so so the leather production happens in clusters it's not uh, evenly distributed in india uh, it happens in clusters uh, can we move to the next slide <clears throat> So the, the focus of today's product uh, presentation is on the working conditions. So uh, the, the leather industry, as much as it is important for the uh, economy of India, as much as it is important for the livelihoods of workers, uh, the sad part is that uh, the working conditions has been uh, precarious and, uh, and poor. Uh, first, when we look at the wages, uh, the wages in the leather sector is one of the lowest. Uh, if you, the majority, the majority of workers in the leather sector earn only a minimum wage or lesser than that. If you look at the minimum wage, it is a bare minimum, which is not even sufficient for workers to live a life of dignity. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the minimum wage in the state of Tamil Nadu uh, is between Euro 81 and euro 87 per month so which is which is not enough for workers to uh, to even uh, fulfill their minimum needs or save money for future there are various categories of workers in the leather industries there are permanent workers there are temporary workers we call them casual workers there are daily wage earners there are also home based workers uh, the, the, the permanent workers earn a little more than minimum wage. Their wage is comparatively better, but, uh, but the other categories of workers are, are earning a wage which is very, very uh, low, often below the minimum wage. But, but the other feature is none of the workers are paid living wages, which is one of our demands. So the next point uh, is the social security. Again here, as I mentioned, uh, the, the formal workers, the workers who we consider permanent workers have access to social security to a certain extent. But the other workers like the, the daily wage earners, the contra contract laborers, the home workers are completely left out of the social security coverage. They don't have a uh, pension, they don't have uh, provident funds and uh, they literally don't have scope for uh, saving any money for future. The other point is uh, compulsory and unpaid overtime. The leather industry uh, is, is seasonal and it, it largely is connected to the purchasing practices of the brands. For example, uh, certain styles of shoes uh, will be in demand in the uh, Western markets for a certain period of time. So in that time, there will be huge demand for a certain style and, and there will be pressure on the suppliers to produce that kind of styles. So this will lead to a pressure or, uh, or, on, on the workers as well. They will be asked to work for more time. They will, the work targets will be high. So they will be asked to do compulsory overtimes. And oftentimes the overtime uh, work is unpaid. According to Indian laws, for any overtime work, the workers have to be paid at double rates, but hardly any factories pay that. The next violation we see uh, in the leather uh, factories is lack of paid leave. Again, as per the Factories Act, as per the Indian law, uh, workers are entitled to earn leave, leaves, but workers are discouraged to take those leaves. So either workers are asked to encash their leaves, get paid in cash, and not allowed to take leaves. And in case if they take leave, they may be subjected to abuses uh, or, or uh, any punishments. So another major focus uh, feature of the leather industry is the occupational health and uh, uh, safety issues. Uh, you know, the tanneries, uh, the conditions in the tanneries are very bad, especially because a lot of chemicals are used. Oftentimes, uh, the factories don't, uh, don't follow the norms. And 
oftentimes the workers are not trained workers who are involved in tanning operations who are asked to work uh, with chemicals are not trained so this leads to a situation where there is high level of high prevalence of occupational diseases and also accidents at workplaces especially in tanneries for example in the state where i come from in tamil nadu uh, we have uh, documented several uh, deaths in 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 uh, tanneries where uh, workers are made to enter into the effluent treatment plants without any protective equipments and they had to inhale uh, inhale inhale the uh, obnoxious gases and they die died immediately so we have documented 20 such deaths in the last one uh, decade the next feature in the leather industry denial of right to freedom of association uh, as you know uh, if you if you look at brands code of conduct brands uh, sustainability reports they talk a lot about freedom of association respect to freedom of us, association but at the factory levels if you see a uh, majority of factories don't have uh, trade unions in them even if fact uh, workers try to form into unions or join unions uh, there are incidents where they are targeted penalized and uh, had to uh, be fired from jo jobs so so consequently uh, the freedom of association uh, is denied and workers are not allowed to democratically participate uh, in in social dialogue and works committee i mean there are several committees that are need to be set up in factories uh, as per the laws works committees canteen committees sexual harassment committees but none of these committees are functional uh, they are on papers but uh, we don't have uh, functional democratically elected committees in the factories that's another feature of the industry and we also see uh, <clears throat> increasing casualization and contractualization of workforce uh, there's no job security for workers and uh, workers uh, have to uh, work on temporary basis uh, with lot of insecurities and uh, this has been another feature and another uh, important uh, aspect that is lacking is the access to grievance redressal mechanisms at factory levels as i mentioned there are no unions or there is no scope for workers to raise their voice or represent but this denial of access to grievance is much more uh, uh, apparent or much more uh, severe because uh, even if even if workers have some complaints or some grievances they don't know how to uh, deal with it they don't know where to report it and even if they report it there is a risk that the, those workers could be targeted and uh, penalized for raising such complaints so that another that is another issue that we have uh, documented in the leather industry and as i mentioned before the committees uh, under under the new uh, anti sexual harassment law uh, sexual harassment committees anti sexual harassment committees needs to be uh, set up in factories with participation of women workers but none of the factories have functional committees that that look into these matters and leather industry employs large number of women uh, workers but uh, but maternity benefits or child care rights uh, many factories don't have crash facilities for uh, the children of workers so uh, child care rights is another uh, 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 shortcoming in the leather industry and presence of child labor is another risk uh, especially in states like uttar pradesh uh, there are there are several studies that have documented the presence of child labor in informal uh, work uh, work centers in 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 home working for example there is involvement of child labor so so this these are the working conditions to 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 capture it in a snapshot uh, i mean this is how it looks like uh shall we shall we uh, move to the next slide yeah so in the last slide we uh <clears throat> we, we we we've saw about the conditions in the factories and tanneries uh, 
but the leather industry also uh, employs large number of home based workers we call them home workers uh, these are predominantly women uh, and uh, and what is home working for example uh, in a factory in a shoe factory uh, certain models of shoe certain styles of uh, shoes require hand stitching these these stitching cannot be done on machines so uh, and it requires large number of people to to stitch so what the factories have found a shortcut uh, that is to subcontract it so the the subcontractors or, or we call them agents who are all uh, uh, men basically from nearby uh, villages where the factories are located they go to the factory get this work and they take it to their villages and distribute it to uh, women there in the villages so ultimately they became home workers so what is the problem with this home working is that the home workers lack visibility so there is absolutely lack of transparency and there is no direct link between the factories and the home workers uh, the link is absolutely missing and the factories have no obligations to recognize them as workers and there is no obligation to pay them uh, the legal wages minimum wages or any social security or anything so this situation had led to workers uh, not recognizing themselves as workers and they are also consequently receiving very low wages uh, they are paid on piece rate basis anywhere between uh, indian rupees 6 to uh, 16 in euro terms it is uh, euro uh, 0.07 uh 2.19 per per pair of shoe uppers that they stitch which is very very low and uh, uh the if you convert it to the monthly wages it is it is several times lower than the legal minimum wages and i as i mentioned before there is no uh, link between the factories and the workers so there is no social security and work is also very very seasonal and irregular for 4 to 5 months they will have work and 4 to 5 months they will not have any work at all and they will not have a source of income during that period and these are the home workers are from very uh, poor social and economic background which means they lack organizing power they don't have an organization or union to represent and there is absolutely no power to negotiate their wages or any other terms of employment with their subcontractors or with the main factory that they work with and the work also uh, leads to many health issues because uh, this is a very uh, taxing uh, work which requires uh, sitting in one place doing repetitive mo movements of stitching so that uh, that affects their eyes their shoulders their muscles uh they, many of them complain chest pain and uh, neck pain and uh, so so uh, as they grow old as they become old they they they, they are unable to even uh, do this type of work because of fatigue and uh, weakness so this is the situation of uh, home workers whom whom cividup works very closely with uh shall we move to the next slide the last one in my presentation so why this happens so i have explained you about the situation of workers in the factories tanneries and the the situ situation of work work uh, workers who work from their homes so what is what is the reason uh, that they have to face this it is because lack of adequate due diligence by brands when we say due diligence uh, the brands have to do some kind of risk assessment to see if there are any uh, risks involved human rights risks in their supply chains they have there is very uh, lack of evidence there is no evidence at all in the leather industries to prove that there is an adequate uh, due diligence that happened and another big concern is lack of transparency and traceability so with the uh, example of uh, home workers i explained you how how opaque or how non transparent the supply chain is so it's very difficult to say where the leather comes from 
many of the brands uh, and retailers focus only on the tier one, that is the shoe factories where the final shoes are made. But the focus is, is not on the tanneries where the situation is very bad and there is, uh, and, uh, there is the, the home working subcontracting supply chain is absolutely left out of the scope. Another major factor is the poor purchasing practices. As I mentioned before, uh, many, of worker, many of the workers in the factories face, uh, I mean, uh, high work targets, work pressure. It is because uh, the brands give very short lead times to suppliers and the prices paid to the suppliers is also very low. So ultimately, uh, there, there is huge pressure on suppliers and that is reflected on the working conditions where the workers are paid low, where they are denied social security, where there is so much pressure on workers to produce more in less time. Another issue we see in the leather sector is the over dependence on social audits. It is also a feature in other supply chains like garment supply chains that brands do social conduct social audits either through third parties or some brands conducted, conduct their own uh, social audits based on their code of conduct. But there are several shortcomings in social audits. The first thing is that uh, the social audits don't look beyond the first year. They don't look at tanneries. They don't look at uh, the uh, situations in the uh, uh, subcontracting supply chains. In the situations of home workers are completely left out of the ambit of social audits. Even within the factories, if, if the social audits identify certain issues, there is no evidence that there are uh, any remedial measures proposed or what actions have been taken on these audits. There's no public reporting on the social audits conducted. So, so there, is, there are several uh, shortcomings in the social audit process. And the ma next main thing is the absence of social dialogue, as I mentioned, uh, there are no trade unions, very, very few trade unions existing today and uh, workers lack voice. Consequently, there is no uh, social dialogue. Uh, let it be wages or other entitlements. It is fixed arbitrarily and uh, the workers voice is not heard. And another concern is the lack of effective grievance redressal mechanism. So if there are any issues at factory level, the workers have no scope to escalate it or to get it resolved by, by a formal process. If they go by the legal route, if they take it to the government or the labor courts, it takes a lot of time and resources which the poor workers are not, uh, cannot afford to. So this is the situation. So I think I have come to the end of my presentation. I conclude with a thanks. Vielen Dank, Pranipal, um, für die interessanten um, Einblicke in die indische Schuh- und Lederindustrie. Um, ich würde jetzt direkt das Wort an Sonja weitergeben, um Sie wird noch mal beleuchten, was sind eigentlich die Auswirkungen der Corona-Pandemie auf die Situation der Arbeiterinnen, die Pranipan ja schon beschrieben hat. Und wie sieht es eigentlich aktuell für die Arbeiterinnen aus? Welche Auswirkungen hat die Pandemie auf die Arbeiterinnen? Dabei werden wir nicht nur auf die Schul- und Lederarbeiterinnen schauen, sondern genereller auf die Arbeiter, auch im Textilbereich. Und würde damit Sonja das Wort geben und danach haben wir dann die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen, auch zu dem genannten ähm, und ähm, das, was Pradipan gesagt hat. Aber jetzt hat Sonja erstmal das Wort. Thank you. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk about our experiences and um, as Pradipan has already set in the context for the plight of the leather workers, I think I'll speak more in general about what happened to the workers in the pandemic and uh, leather workers of course is an area of our work but it's also essential to understand 
that what is the plight of workers in India in general. So uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who, who was who had time to participate in this uh, event. It's a uh, it's a Saturday. It's a weekend, and not everybody is free during the afternoon. But you still took your time out. Uh, I represent the organization called Society for Labor and Development. It's uh, popularly known as SLD. Uh, SLD is a labor rights and a labor support organization, and we are based in Delhi. It was uh, established in 2006 uh, with the mission to empower workers and their families so that they live a life of dignity. Uh, so, I think uh, SLD is also known as a research organization like CVDEP, and we also conduct a lot of research on subjects related to workers' rights in order to inform the larger audience on the plight of the workers in general and the industry. So I will, uh, if there are any questions that are addressed either to the sector or to our organization, I'll be happy to respond after our presentation or in the question answer session. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yes, so Society for Labor and Development, uh, we work practically on four sectors. We work with domestic workers, garment workers, leather workers, and seafood processing industry workers. Um, I would like to share a little background of the workers that we work with. So most of these workers are migrant workers. And by migrant workers, what I mean is they actually move from their area of residence to another place of work. So there is a movement of the worker from their source area, which is their area of domicile, to the destination area where the urban spaces are mostly located. And by urban spaces, I am just not talking about major cities that employ a large chunk of these workers in the formal and the informal sector. I also mean uh, the upcoming cities, uh, which are semi-urban or in the semi-rural areas. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yes, so we practically as an organization focus on labor, education, gender equality, migration, global production network, uh, which means that we look at global supply chains and how they act and behave in order to ensure issues of business and human rights. Uh, and we provide legal aid to the workers. So our primary aim is to reach out to the working class and to address poor people's rights in different supply chains. Next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of uh, the workers who are primarily involved in different sectors in India. Um, of course, there are different statistics that are quoted by different agencies. I have taken the statistics from BBC which was quoted in 2020. So according to BBC, we approximately have around 40 million migrant workers in India. And most of them, as Pradeepan mentioned, work in low, are found in low paying and insecure jobs. And the key sectors are construction, hospitality, textiles, manufacturing, transportation, services, and domestic work. As I mentioned in my previous slide, Migrant workers are from the deprived, poverty-stricken regions within India, and they travel to bigger urban spaces in search of work. We also need to understand that most of these migrant workers uh, who cater to larger industries and to the economy in general are from historically disadvantaged communities. They are uh, either scheduled castes or scheduled tribes. And they are primarily the oppressed classes within the country who have been denied of their rights for generations and just not one generation. And that's precisely the reason why we are calling them as historically disadvantaged communities. So they possibly comprise of 40% of the seasonal migrant workforce. And by seasonal migrant workforce, uh, I practically mean that the workforce that is always on the move, which means they work for a particular sector for six months, seven months, one year, 
they go back to their hometown and then they come back again. So there is always a movement in the workforce and that's precisely the reason sometimes it's very difficult to trace uh, which area that they are working in. And that's precisely the reason why we cannot always give an accurate statistics about the plight of the migrant workers in India. So as you see that uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, they comprise of 40% of the seasonal migrant workforce, even if their population is just 25% of our total population within India. So most of these sectors uh, do not represent the rights of the workers uh, and it always leaves the workers far more vulnerable than what they are. So it is a dream that they follow, which means that they come to the cities to have a better life, uh, to have access to better healthcare, education for their children, and their needs which are unmet at their source areas are met. However, it further pushes them into a vicious cycle of poverty, of deprivation, or different kinds of issues, uh, which uh, always is not a very happy state to be in. So uh, we will see in the next slides what happened to the workers uh, during the COVID crisis. Next uh, slide, please. Yes, so I have been asked to speak about, um, in general, about the corona crisis and its impact on workers. So you can see a picture of people actually walking down the highway. And uh, it is, uh, it, it's not a very happy picture, actually. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad state of being. Uh, and if you look at the COVID pandemic, it was a, it's a global health pandemic. And we wonder why, it, what is the impact of the pandemic on the workers and why should we be concerned about it? So as I mentioned that there is a huge chunk of the rural population migrating to the urban spaces looking for job opportunities, and that's how, how the industries grow. So with 22nd of March, our, the national, uh, an announcement was made at the national level for a lockdown. And what happened was it created a chaos. And the chaos was prepared, were, people were not prepared to handle this crisis. So it led to exodus, a mass movement, a mass movement of people actually trying to get back to their home in the villages. And uh, it was not very easy because it was a state of lockdown, which means that there was no movement, there was no transportation, there were no clear instructions given by the government or other sources in terms of what is going to happen to these workers who are in these cities, actually catering to different industries, catering to the middle class, catering to the upper class. So it, uh, it left the working class pretty uh, in a bad state of being because they were insecure about what is going to happen to them uh, because the factories were shut down. They did not know when the factories are going to be open. And uh, staying in the cities meant that they had to pay rents, they had to pay for food, they had to pay for the education, and they had to pay for electricity. So basically, it was a huge source. It, it created a huge imbalance in terms of the income and the spending. So that left the workers, a lot of these workers, we saw there was a mass movement, and I'm sure you've seen in different medias and different, uh, uh, covered by different media or different news, the movement of people, the movement of workers in India from the cities back to the villages. So, and then we, uh, it basically created a state of semi-starvation. And why we call it semi-starvation? Because uh, workers, by the time they started work, walking back, you'll see what we saw a huge population of workers actually trying to walk back to their hometown. So whatever savings they had, all those savings were basically spent on food. They, if they had children, they had to basically cater to the health needs of their children. And it created, it pressed the panic button. People did not know what to eat. 
we have stories of people who were actually walking for 20 days, 30 days. They were on the road to reach back to the villages, to reach back to their hometown. So all the savings that they had was practically spent on either food. So by the time they came back to their home villages, they practically had nothing. They were, they did not have enough to even buy food. And that's where we actually reached out to a lot of workers with our relief, uh, both CVDEP and SLD. We reached out to a lot of leather workers with relief where we uh, had to reach out to them with food essentials for a period of one month so that they could support their families because they were out of food, they were out of basic needs, they were out of basic essentials. And uh, why we think that the whole process was the was a dehumanization process because it did not have a safety net. The safety net, which usually is offered by the government was completely absent, which means there was no social protection that was offered to the workers. And if you look at the industry, if you look at the, any major industry, if you look at the garment industry, if you look at uh, the leather industry or the seafood industry or the construction or any other industry, so basically it stopped work, it was stopped work. And you did not know whether you are going to get back to work. You did not know whether you will be taken back to work. So, uh, and the government did not have a major role to play in terms of offering social protection to the workers. The suppliers did not know how to offer any entitlement to the workers, which meant that a lot of orders that the suppliers had received from the vans were being canceled. There was no guarantee that whatever orders were placed to the suppliers, the brands are going to take it back. There was a huge amount of bargaining that was happening between the brands and the suppliers with respect to asking for a deduction in the orders already placed. And if you look at the garment industry, there was a uh, there is an AEPC report that actually talks about how brands were pressing the suppliers for a 40% discount on the available, on the orders that were already placed. So in this situation, in if the supplier has to give a 40% deduction on the order that's already placed, which is much better than having those orders brought in their factory, what happens? What happens next is a lot of these workers are terminated and whatever social security benefits that they are entitled to are always denied of. And this is exactly what we saw when the workers were terminated from work. They were not offered work back when the situation regained normalcy. And it created a chaotic situation for them where fear and insecurity actually started building into the lives of the workers. So we heard stories from workers where they said that if this is how the city has treated us in terms of a crisis, we will never come back to the city. We will never come back to work again. But what happened over a period of time, uh, there was not enough work at the village level. There was not enough work at their hometown. And there was a demand of workers at the city again. So the workers who had practically taken 20 days to come back to their hometown, they were again walking back to their place of work because there was nothing at their hometown. There was no job security, there was no income, there was no sustainable flow of uh, any livelihood opportunities. So the insecurity actually pushed workers to go back to the cities again, so that in search of work. And we actually saw that the workers who'd actually walked back again in search of work, some of them are waiting and assuming that they would be taken back to work one day. Uh, they are asked to come to work possibly once or twice in a week. There is no sustained flow of work. There is no sustained flow of income. So coming back to the cities have not uh, basically created any, any space of security for them. It only built their insecurity further, which meant they were feeling extremely nervous to be in their hometown and coming back to their place of work also did not give them enough security that they, it's important. Uh, so basically this Corona crisis 
uh, impacted workers in general. And here, when I'm talking about workers, I'm talking about low wage workers. And that's where our area of work is. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, so uh, basically I will not say that nothing was done. I think what was done in piecemeal by different governments and by the state governments in India was uh, free transportation was offered to the workers to get back to their hometown. Subsidized food was offered. There were attempts to create job opportunities at the state level. And uh, I will say that it was not, it is, it, it's, I cannot say that it's a complete failure, but I don't think in a situation where there is a pandemic and where they, you have to abide to social distancing norms, you can do a lot by in creating economic opportunities for these low wage workers. So what needs to be done? And uh, these recommendations are basically not the recommendations of our organization. I think these recommendations came as a result of our interaction with workers in different spheres. I'm here talking about the workers that we work with. And they thought that it's essential to create job opportunities to ensure livelihood security. And uh, it's essential to get fair wages because we also saw that a lot of these workers had their wage cut because the factory said that we do not have enough orders, there are not enough orders and we possibly cannot pay you the full wage. So there needs to be a wage cut. So it is essential for us to ensure that even if the workers are taken back to work, they should be given fair wages. And here we are talking about minimum wage and not living wage. I think living wage would be a, a dream to the workers at this juncture when already there is a health crisis, which is leading to an economic crisis as well. Uh, I think in the name of social protection, what at the least should be offered to the workers is food, shelter and health care. I think these are the areas which uh, need, a, where the workers need a lot of support. And these are also the areas where they spend a lot. If you look at these three areas of food, shelter and health care, because coming and staying in a city where you're, it actually in, increases your expenses. So we cannot deny these three core factors which needs to be addressed. Uh, for suppliers, I think uh, this is not a time where they should be labeled as, uh, as bodies who have not taken responsibility because I think the suppliers have also incurred huge losses as a result of the brands canceling orders. And they need to be supported as well so that they can restore the livelihood of the workers. So we, we actually feel that it's time that the government and the supplier should come forward and create an advocacy uh, space where they actually ask the brands to take responsible for this crisis, if not wholly, but at least partially. Uh, we also feel that the brands need to compensate for the wage loss as a result of this massive layoff of workers. We know from different sectors that we work in that there has been huge margins of termination of workers. And it has also led to casualization, which means that more workers are taken on a daily wage level, daily wage basis, rather than offering permanent jobs or jobs for a sustained time period of let's say six months, a year or so. So these are the spaces which actually enhances the vulnerability and this is not a state to be in when already there is an external crisis that you're dealing with. So I think it's time we actually advocate for uh, a sustained livelihood option for the workers that would create security not only for themselves but also for the families that they support. And in most cases, we know that the workers are the only source of, uh, uh, I mean, they are the only income manager. I mean, they, they are the people who possibly earn only earners within the families and they run the family of four or five or six people. And sometimes these kind of crises not only affects the workers individually, but it also impacts let's say a family of four or five or six, which includes their families within the city, the families back home. So I think uh, uh, this Corona crisis needs to be seen more, not only as a health uh, crisis, but it's also leading to an economic crisis, which 
mm, I think uh, people who are concerned about the rights of the workers need to talk about it more rather than people who people like us who are just working on it. I think there is some support of a large audience is always helpful in creating a larger collective voice. Um, I think with that, I end my presentation. Ja, vielen Dank, Sonja, auch für deine sehr eindrucksvolle Präsentation. Ich würde an dieser Stelle jetzt gerne das, ähm, die Diskussion für das Publikum und für ähm, öffnen und möchte fragen, gibt es von eurer Seite Fragen? Wenn ja, könnt ihr euch gerne melden, könnt Fragen stellen, ähm, könnt mit Sonja und Pralipan diskutieren. Ähm, entweder stellt ihr die Fragen unten in der Fragen- und Antworten-Möglichkeit ähm, oder ihr hebt eure Hand und Helen stellt euer Mikrofon frei. Okay, bisher keine Fragen, dann habe ich direkt eine Frage. Ähm, Ihr habt ja sehr, sehr eindrücklich beschrieben, wie die Situation der Arbeiterin aussieht, ähm, sage ich mal unter normalen Umständen, als auch jetzt äh, in Zeiten der normalen ähm, äh, der Corona-Pandemie. Ähm, was mich interessieren würde, oder was nochmal spannend ist, vielleicht auch für die ähm, TeilnehmerInnen hier, ist, ähm, ihr hattet ja schon einige Möglichkeiten und einige Wege aufgezählt, was sich ändern muss. Mich würde noch mal interessieren, wie eure Arbeit genau aussieht. Also Pralipan und Sonja, ihr hattet ja beide schon so ein bisschen beschrieben, wie arbeitet CVDEP, wie arbeitet SLD. Aber ähm, vielleicht noch mal, dass ihr das noch mal darlegen könnt, wie sieht eure Arbeit eigentlich aus, eure tägliche Arbeit mit den ArbeiterInnen? Ähm, was sind die Herausforderungen darin, die ArbeiterInnen zu unterstützen und diese dann auch zu stärken? Wer möchte von euch? Ja. Yeah. I can go. Okay. Uh, so in normal times, uh, uh, our work looked very different from uh, how we actually work now uh, in, the, in the pandemic situation. So as, as uh, labor support organizations, uh, both CVDEP and SLD, uh, we had to be uh, in regular touch with workers. We had to work closely with workers. So which meant that we uh, needed some strategies to, uh, to, be, to do that, to be in touch with workers constantly. So what CVDEP uh, followed is the approach of workers resource center Uh, in all the sectors that we uh, work, uh, be it garments, leather or electronics, uh, we have set up workers resource centers in areas where uh, the factories are located. Uh, so, so what are these workers resource center? Uh, these are, uh, the, the workers resource center act as a point or a hub for workers to come and gather. Uh, We, we offer, offer workers different services in workers, worker resource centers. We have our field staffs based there. So be it uh, getting access to uh, government benefits or schemes or uh, get, applying for social security benefits. So workers find it very difficult to do it because primarily all these things have become online now. So workers many times lack uh, digital literacy to do that. So our staff uh, members help workers in doing that. Uh, it requires paperwork, for example, uh, to apply for some government schemes and to collect all those documents to also help workers understand what, what are the uh, documents that they would require to apply for certain schemes. So our staff members do that. Apart from this, we also conduct uh, training programs in these workers resource centers. So uh, we conduct study circles, we conduct awareness sessions on various themes like health, hygiene, 
uh, occupational health and safety, uh, labor laws. Uh, so, so these are all the kinds of work that we used to do in normal times. And the overall focus of this work is to help workers, to support workers, to collectivize uh, and to get their voices heard. In the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sectors which are already union, unionized, CVDEP uh, works along with those existing unions. And in sectors where uh, there is absolutely no unionization or organizations, for example, the home-based workers, uh, CVDEP works with workers directly in kind of collectivizing them, uh, helping them to kind of form into some kind of an organization, though not as a union, but some kind of a, a federation or a collective like that. So in normal times, this has been our work with workers. Yeah, I can just add to what uh, Pradeepan just said. I think uh, mm, both SLD and CVDEP are labor support organizations. Uh, so it might create a confusion in the sense that what is a labor right and a labor support organization. So uh, we basically create spaces for workers to understand their rights. I think that is primarily our objective because uh, the workers who we interact with, once we start interacting with them, we realize that they are not even aware of their rights. And uh, here, when I'm talking about the rights, I'm talking about the statutory laws that basically talk about securing the rights of the workers. It could be the wages that they received. It could be the payment of their wages, the hours. It could be sexual harassment at workplace. Uh, it could be areas of forced for labor. So our work with the, the leather workers in Uttar Pradesh is primarily about helping them understand their rights at workplace, which means we give trainings on labor laws by our lawyers. Lawyers basically encapsulate the information to make it more friendly, user friendly to the workers because we realize that uh, it's not always useful. The kind of information that the workers need is not always useful in the kind of, uh, in the legal language that's available. So it's very important to break down that information into smaller pieces which are digestible to the workers. So that's what we do primarily. Uh, we also do research, which means that we, it's our attempt to understand that how the supply chain works, because unless we know what the supply chain looks like, who are the actors who are at place. And when I say actors, I'm talking about the brands, the suppliers, uh, the workers who are working in specific supply chain. It becomes very difficult to even hold any brand or supplier accountable in cases where due diligence is not followed, in cases where their rights are violated at workplace. So I think the research through research, we not only gather information from the ground, but we also inform the larger audience about specific supply chains and how it operates and what are the violations that happens and why it needs to be addressed when we talk in the perspective of business and human rights. Uh, so this is second work that we do. And the third piece of work that we do, uh, which Pradeepan already mentioned, is about collectivization of the workforce. Because we realize that until unless we create spaces of collective bargaining, which means that the workers are not actually coming into the forefront and talking about their rights and talking about why, where their rights are violated and what their rights are, we are not creating a sustainable model of change because always intermediary agencies cannot be in the picture. It's essential for us to basically empower the workers so that they start talking about their rights. It's important for us to create collective of workers because until, unless we do that, we understand that there are resources, there are uh, fund crunches, and the way our government is actually operating, sometimes there are not enough spaces for civil society to actually advocate for the rights of the oppressed classes. So here we are trying to create models of change, and by that I actually mean by creating uh, a workforce that understands their rights, that can speak about their rights, and also understand where they are in the entire supply chain and why it's important for them to understand what their, how their rights are violated.
Vielen Dank, Sonja und Freidekan. Ich sehe, es ist eine Frage aufgetaucht im Chat. Ich würde die mal gerade vorlesen. Da geht es vor allem darum, Freidekan, du hattest ja eben schon Sozialaudits auch genannt in deiner Präsentation. Hier möchte jemand wissen, welche Rolle spielt eigentlich die Regierung, zum Beispiel das Arbeitsministerium, darin, die Arbeitsrechte zu kontrollieren und zu schauen, dass diese auch umgesetzt werden. Und welche Rolle spielen aber auch nicht nur nationale äh, Regierungen, sondern auch internationale Organisationen, wie zum Beispiel die ähm, Internationale Arbeitsorganisation, die ILO. Thank you, Lena. Uh, social audits, if you look at, it's largely uh, done by the brands. Uh, by the companies uh, with, with support from third party social audit firms or it sometimes uh, brands themselves do their team themselves do social audits. But uh, the question pertaining to the role of uh, the Labor Department, they have uh, something called labor inspection, they don't call it audit uh, under Indian law it's called labor ins inspection and uh, uh, any factory that needs to be separate uh, set up in India needs to get a license. So the factory uh, labor department, uh, the district labor department uh, staff have to go and inspect it. And even after the factory opens from time to time, the uh, labor department officials have to go and conduct inspections. So that is as per the law. But the problem is in the implementation. So uh, the district labor department have many factories under their ambit. So they absolutely lack uh, the resources and capacity to conduct as, my, as many uh, audits uh, or inspections. And there is also a problem uh, that uh, most of these inspections, even if conducted are not unannounced audits or inspections. So there are many practical problems in that. So what happens is like only when an incident happens, when an accident happens, uh, the, uh, the real inspection take place and uh, the factories, uh, 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 the labor department takes action against the erring company. Till then, I think uh, it, it goes on like that. So that's been the problem. With a question to uh, ILO, the role of ILO, they really do play an important role at the policy level because many of the uh, laws and legislations that uh, uh, are proposed uh, make reference to ILO standards. So to speak, that ILO standards are uh, uh, very important, uh, but, but uh, the problem is that how well they are implemented or what are all the uh, scope for implementation in the uh, laws? Are they, are they robust? Are they effective? So that's the problem. In recent time, during the pandemic, uh, there were many attempts by state governments to dilute labor laws to, uh, to, to uh, make it easier for companies to set up and to relax labor law to, to, to make sure that there is flexibility in labor laws. Then uh, the ILO, for example, wrote a letter to the prime minister saying that this is not advisable. So we saw that intervention as a very positive step. So they do play a constructive role. Sonia, would you, would you like to add something to it? No. Okay, vielen Dank, Freidekan. Gibt es sonst Fragen? Ähm, oder gerne auch. Achso, Sonja, möchtest du noch? No, I think uh, Pradipan has covered most of it. So, um, uh, just to give an example, how uh, ILO came into the picture, uh, because I work in the state of Uttar Pradesh and uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, there were announcements of actually relinquishing all labor laws for the next three years to attract more business. And it's because of the intervention of the ILO, uh, the recommendations of the ILO was taken into consideration and the labor laws were not 
basically repealed, which means that uh, there were, for example, there were uh, uh, policies that possibly advocated of 12 hours of work for workers in the leather industry or any industry in Uttar Pradesh. So it is, it is a definition that falls under the forced labor uh, thing of ILO where somebody is made to work beyond the stipulated time period of eight hours. And I think all these uh, interventions would not have uh, happened about uh, the necessary measures of actually repealing or rejecting these kind of Herculean laws would not have happened if uh, there was no intervention of the ILO. But again, ILO also has tripartite agreements, which means uh, it has its own limitations. It can only provide recommendations. It is up to the necessary the national and the state governments to even acknowledge and accept and implement the recommendations. So it is a voluntary organization, a voluntary body that basically advocates of good work practices, but it is up to you to even implement them or not. So I think uh, there is a gap. And uh, I think one of the, um, uh, what the question that was asked was um, more about the necessary measures that are taken by the state governments and the national governments to protect the workers under the ambit of the law. I think there are laws in place. There are 44 laws uh, related to labor rights, which has been encapsulated into four codes and uh, which are on uh, possibly on wages and occupation, health and safety. And uh, I, I'm forgetting the other two. Uh, so I think there are measures which are taken, but uh, there are also uh, invisible actions. Like there, the law is in place, but we do not know how, uh, whether the law is implemented correctly, whether the workers are protected under the provisions of the act that are mentioned. I think that is something that we need to question on. Uh, otherwise, we are a robust country. We have amazing laws in place. But uh, when it comes to implementation, the fact that we do not even have the exact number of migrant workers in our country, and we had this massive crisis of workers actually moving from one place to the other in search of food and shelter and basic necessities, that actually shows that uh, why we are failing why the laws that we have in place are actually not being able to protect the rights of the workers. So this is just an adjoinder to what Padipan said, and I think he covered most of it. Vielen Dank, Sonja. Um, ich sehe, hier sind noch zwei Fragen aufgetaucht. Um, Genau, wie eure Einschätzung zu einem Lieferkettengesetz in Deutschland ist. Es wird ja hier in Deutschland viel diskutiert, das Lieferkettengesetz und ähm, Deutschland ja als einer der Hauptabnehmer auch vom indischen Leder. Ähm, habt ihr da eine Einschätzung zu, welche Auswirkungen dies auf die ähm, Arbeiterinnen vor Ort hat, ähm, wenn es in Deutschland oder auch auf europäischer Ebene ein Lieferkettengesetz ähm, geben würde? I thought Sonia will go first. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think it is a welcome step uh, in, in, in direction towards uh, uh, human rights due diligence. Uh, we, we always keep it as a demand that uh, uh, the, the uh, United Nations uh, guiding principle on uh, business and human rights, which proposes uh, all all transnational organizations to do uh, human rights due diligence. I think uh, this uh, law uh, is a step towards that, because right now, if you see, there is absolute lack of accountability. For example, the pandemic itself has exposed the uh, weaknesses in the supply chain model. And it exposed the vulnerability of the workers uh, as as never before. Uh, so this these all calls for a kind of a, a change in working. And I think uh, this this uh, 
law, supply chain law is a step towards that. I hope it will usher in transparency and tra traceability in the first place. And then it also paves way for uh, uh, an effective human rights due diligence strategy for companies to comply with. I hope it is a mandatory thing uh, because there are many voluntary in instruments and the problem with voluntary instruments is that it's easy to keep it aside. So yeah, that's, that's my concern. Yeah, I would just like to add, uh, I think uh, mm, this is exactly what we are advocating for as labor rights organizations. So we are advocating for uh, accountable supply chain. And I think this law is going to obviously impact the industries <clears throat> that basically uh, supply to the consumers in Germany. And I think it is absolutely, absolutely essential for us to even understand where is this going? Who are the brands that are actually procuring uh, uh, the goods from? Who are the suppliers? Who are the workers? Because uh, it is very difficult for us to trace uh, in the sense if a particular worker is working for a particular supplier and that supplier is supplying to a particular brand. So until, unless we have that mechanism in place, it is very, very difficult for us to even talk about transparency and accountability in supply chains. And that is something, uh, if you look at the Modern Slavery Act in UK, which basically talks about the transparency in supply chains as a mandatory reporting, I am not sure it actually accounts for transparency in supply chains, but at least it's one of the measures that are taken by which civil society can hold the supplier or the brands in the subsequent supply chain accountable. In this case, we can't hold anyone accountable because we don't always have the right information that we require to hold someone accountable for any kind of rights violation. I think this is very, very important step. Thank you, Sonia and Pranipan. There is another question. At the end of our time, angekommen. Wir haben aber hier noch zwei Fragen, die ich auch noch weitergeben möchte an euch. Einerseits geht es um die um Frauen nochmal in den Fabriken und um, ob es einerseits was wie Eltern Mutterschutz gibt und was mit den Frauen passiert, wenn sie Kinder bekommen, ob sie dann auch weiterarbeiten in den Fabriken, also die Rolle der Frauen. Und dann die zweite Frage stelle ich jetzt auch nochmal, dann könnt ihr überlegen, wie ihr sie beantwortet. Ähm, ja, was ist eigentlich die wichtigste Message, die wichtigste Nachricht für eure Future Designers? Ähm, also was ist die Nachricht, die ihr den Designern mitgeben möchtet? Well, I, 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 I think I'll go uh, now. So, uh, so to answer the first question that do women in India still work in the factories when they get married and have children? Yes, they do. And uh, there is a maternity, under the Maternity uh, Act, you have a provision of uh, six months paid leave. <clears throat> but in most cases, what we see is most of these workers are not employed as permanent workers and only permanent workers are entitled to this benefit. So uh, what happens in practice is the moment the factories come to know that a particular worker, a woman worker is pregnant and if she's working as a contract worker or a daily wage worker, she is terminated from work. This is the practice on the ground so that the company does not have to take the burden of giving her six months of leave and six months of paid leave that which is a loss of the production time which is a loss to the government and to the supplier so i don't think in practice this is followed and the fact that if you are into contractual or daily wage work it's very difficult to prove your employment with a particular supplier there's practically no proof of employment there are no records of the workers 
so it becomes far more difficult for us to even prove that the right has been violated and that's also the reason why uh, factories prefer employing women workers because it's easy to violate their rights it's easy to control them and it's a power play so it is it's it's a different conversation on gender based violence that we are entering into because it is a play of power and patriarchy that we have in different supply chains that leads to gender based violence which also means violating the rights of women workers as women just not as workers and uh, i think i will just uh, uh, respond to the second question and pradeepan can add it's a very interesting question actually what do you think should be the most important message to a future designers um i think most of these people uh, who work as designers are aspiring individuals and they are very young and i think when i was young i did not know about any of these uh things on ethics and accountability and uh, i think what i knew was all theoretical i did not have any practical exposure uh so i think it's very important for future designers to understand who are they working for and uh, uh if you actually look at uh, different uh, advocacy bodies like asia floor wage alliance which talks about living wages of garment workers and there are calculations about how much a garment worker is paid for the t-shirt that they make so suppose if a t-shirt is sold for 40 dollars what a garment worker might end up getting is possibly 25 cents for that particular t-shirt and i don't know whether designers can choose to work for ethical agencies which talks about transparency which talks about fair wages but unfortunately if you see the code of conduct of uh, different garment uh, brands they all have their code of conduct in place so unless you start working for one you never know what code of conduct has been violated so and i think as uh, designers it's important as a young generation it's extremely important uh, to even convey these messages to your fellow members that you know that the supply chain uh, where we are working in has these rights violation and how as designers you can advocate for their rights is something that we have never thought of uh, strategizing but i think this uh leaves us with a message that even designers might be interested in advocating for a clean and transparent supply chain so uh if there are more people who are willing to work with us in in forwarding our agenda it's we'll be really happy to even take this forward uh, pradeepan can add uh thanks sonia uh i don't to have much to add but uh, to the the to the previous question on uh, women workers and uh, uh, their ability to work after marriage and uh, childbirth uh, if you look uh, at sevidab's work we started our work with home based workers in the leather sector so who are these home based workers they are actually workers who have worked in factories previously and post their marriages and post childbirth they were not able to go back to work in the factories uh, because of the burden of child care which is invariably on women and also there is no supportive system in the factories to that support uh, working mothers there's no crash facilities though there's no uh, flexibility at work so they prefer staying at home and they this this home working comes handy for them to earn an income so so such is the situation in the factories that they don't they are not supportive to mothers and to the question about uh, the message to designers as uh, sonia mentioned i think uh, i the young designers have to be conscious conscious that uh, uh the 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 situation they should be conscious of the working conditions in the supply chains uh, in the tanneries and 
and the hidden workers, the home workers, for example. For example, the shoes that are designed, uh, when, when we talk to the brands about home working, they say uh, in the coming days, there might be no requirement for hand stitched shoes, for example. So there will be a change in design, for example. So these are all changes that will have severe impact on the workers down the supply chain. So I think the designers should be conscious how, how their work might kind of end up impacting the workers either in a positive or negative way. So I think they should be aware of all these things in the supply chains, the situation of workers in the production countries. So, and not just learn, but they also should spread this message to their colleagues and to the communities. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Pradipan und Sonja. Um, wir haben schon ein paar Minuten überzogen. Um, vielen Dank für euch beiden, dass ihr euch heute die Zeit genommen habt und uns um, so gute Eindrücke gegeben habt in die Lederindustrie, in die Situation der Arbeiterinnen in Indien. Vielen Dank an euch. Um, vielen Dank auch an alle TeilnehmerInnen hier heute. Um, ich habe uh, mich gefreut dass ihr dabei wart. Mit unserer Veranstaltungsreihe geht es noch weiter. Also wir beschäftigen uns weiter mit, dem, mit der globalen Modeindustrie, mit den Missständen, aber wir beschäftigen uns auch damit, was sind eigentlich Alternativen, was sind auch Handlungsmöglichkeiten. Und da möchte ich euch ganz herzlich zu einladen. Die nächsten Veranstaltungen werden alle auf Deutsch sein. Und es gibt insgesamt noch fünf Veranstaltungen online. Und dann gibt es am Ende auch noch einen Workshop, zu dem ihr wirklich gerne präsent hinkommen könnt. Ich würde mich freuen, wenn wir weiter voneinander hören, wenn wir gemeinsam auf dem Laufenden bleiben und uns austauschen zu der globalen Modeindustrie und Themen rundherum um die Missstände als auch um Handlungsmöglichkeiten. Vielen Dank nochmal.